What more is there to say? Corpses lay unattended in their own homes. No priests, sons, fathers, or kinsmen dared to enter. Few who caught the disease ever recovered. So rapidly did it spread that it seemed one man could infect the whole world. Ships, with their lethal cargoes of infected rats and fleas, were the surest and fastest means of spreading the plague. Within days of a ship putting into port, the entire town would have been exposed to the deadly bacillus. From Sicily, the plague reached the mainland and swept across Italy. Following the trade routes, it spread in all directions, covering the land with a blanket of death. Travellers told stories of deserted villages and miles of countryside littered with bodies. In early 1348, Guy de Chiliac, a cleric and the Pope's personal doctor, heard news that the Black Death was only weeks from the Papal Palace at Avignon. Guy studied the movement of the stars and planets and reported his findings to his master, Pope Clement VI. He explained that God's warnings, heavy clouds, blasts of hot winds, falling stars, and a column of fire seen above the papal palace all signaled that a terrible affliction was at hand. The configuration of the heavens is the cause of this pestilence. In 1345, at one hour after noon on March the 20th, there was a major conjunction of three planets in Aquarius. This signifies death. At once, de Chiliac scoured the books of Arab philosophers and physicians and the reports of the medical faculty in Paris for advice on how to avert the impending disaster. The philosophers advised that the corrupted air should be purified with fire. This would drive away the infected cloud that caused the plague. So when the plague was in reach of the Pope's palace, de Chiliac ordered huge fires to be built within the papal grounds. Then the doctor arranged for the Pope to sit between them. The Pope's fires burned day and night for four months, while the plague raged through Avignon. No rat or flea could penetrate the intense heat. The Pope sat protected in splendid isolation all through the heat of the summer. Meanwhile, in the city of Avignon, thousands continued to die. They believed that the corrupted atmosphere had infected the population with plague. Regardless of the risk to himself, Guy de Chiliac visited the sick throughout the epidemic. The disease was most humiliating for doctors who were unable to help. If they risked visiting their patients, they could do no good and so earned no fees, for almost all the infected died. After several grueling weeks, de Chiliac finally fell ill himself. Observing the telltale boils on his own body, he took to his bed, fearing he might have only days to live. For the next six weeks, he attempted to treat himself. Believing his body had been corrupted by the infected cloud, he submitted to regular bleedings, using a heated cup to draw his blood to the surface of the skin and so draw out the poisons. 
Whenever he could summon the strength, he would record his symptoms in detail. To his surprise, he began to record a recovery. Having survived the plague, de Chiliac was even more determined to continue his research. It was not long before he made a breakthrough. It was of two types. The first with continuous fever and spitting of blood. From this, one died in three days. The second, also with continuous fever, but with carbuncles on the armpits and groin. From this, one died in five days. De Chiliac had correctly diagnosed that there were two types of plague, and that the first, pneumonic plague, was more infectious and more deadly than the second, bubonic plague. So remarkable was this discovery that the Pope, for the first time, gave his blessing to the dissection of the dead, which had previously been forbidden as a sin. Most people had no confidence in doctors. The rich simply fled from the plague, but most could not. Sometimes the sick were even bricked up in their houses to stop the disease from spreading, but to no avail. Some tried to find their own cures. They took pills made of stag's horn, or potions of powdered gold. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Take a live frog and lay the belly of it next to the plague sore. If the patient will escape the plague, the frog will burst. Having escaped the plague, the Pope sought to prevent its spread elsewhere. He ordered devout processions and encouraged ceremonies that involved a new sect, the flagellants. Miserere nobis, domine. Miserere nobis, domine. They practiced self-flagellation in an attempt to purge mankind of sin. Flagellants roamed the countryside, believing that their self-imposed pain and suffering would cause God to lift his curse and save the world. Before long, the flagellants openly criticized the Catholic Church for failing the people at this crucial time. They interrupted religious services and looted church property. In their search for scapegoats, they falsely accused the Jews of poisoning the drinking water. Throughout Europe, Jews were massacred. The Pope realized that the movement he himself had encouraged was now a grave threat to public order. He sent letters to the kings of Europe ordering them to suppress the flagellants. The movement disappeared, but their descent added to a growing feeling that perhaps the established church was no longer absolute. This dissension would resurface 150 years later in the Great Reformation. The plague would stay in any one place for several months and then move on. In just two years, it had swept across Western Europe, spread north over to England, and then finally to Scandinavia. By 1350, it had run its course. The Black Death killed a third of Europe's population. Over 20 million people died. This devastation was a turning point that changed the face of Europe beyond recognition. Michael of Piazza recorded the chaos that the plague had left in its wake. Families were torn apart, villages deserted, business collapsed, states bankrupted by loss of taxes. Those who survived bore the burden of guilt. A new mentality emerged. There was a strengthened belief in God, but an increased skepticism 
about the established church. Shortage of labor had shifted the balance of power between the lords and their tenants. Authority and tradition were no longer accepted without question. The cause of the plague would remain a mystery until the late 19th century. It was then discovered that the rats and fleas were the carriers of the bacillus, but that it was the fleas that transmitted the disease from the rats to man. A single flea bite can cause death. After the Black Death, the plague returned to haunt Europe every few decades until the mid-17th century, though never again with the ferocity of that first outbreak. Even today, the terror that it created can still be heard in the nursery rhyme that children sing. Oh, boy.